And good afternoon and welcome to the Seven Theatre, uh, to the Shropshire County Pension Fund's annual meeting. I'm Malcolm Pate, I'm Chairman of the Pensions Committee. Uh, today you will hear from Justin Bridges about the Pensions Fund's investments and how the fund invests. Uh, we're also fortunate to have Joe Blum from Global Infrastructure Partners uh, with us today, and welcome. Uh, partners, uh, he's from Global Infrastructures uh, and he deals with infrastructure investment, which he's going to talk about, about later. And you, you'll also hear from James Walton, the fund scheme administrator, who will provide an update on the 2013 actual variation, uh, valuation and update you on the key issues which the fund is currently addressing. Uh, as you're all aware, the local government pension scheme is changing from next year. Therefore, Debbie Sharp will provide an update on, on the latest details with regard to the new scheme for 2014. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Justin Bridges, who is to give you an investment update. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Justin Bridges. I'm the Head of Treasury and Pensions at uh, Shropshire Council. And I'm here today to give you an overview of the Pension Fund's investment. The fund continues to have two main investment objectives. The primary objective is to aim for a fully funded scheme. In other words, to make sure we have enough money to pay pensions in the future. The second objective is to keep the employer contribution rate as low and stable as possible. And the investment management arrangements of the fund are designed to achieve both of these objectives. The local government pension scheme is a funded scheme. This means that your contributions are invested to fund future pensions. As you can see, the Shropshire Fund invests in a wide range of different asset classes. How the assets are split is the most important decision the pension committee makes, as this has the biggest impact on how the value of the fund grows over time. As at the 31st of March 2013, we adopted the split shown in this slide for diversification, as not all investment types perform well at a particular time. All of the fund's investments are managed externally. We appoint specialist investment managers to do this. Each of those managers is given the benchmark relating to the area in which they invest and are asked to outperform this benchmark over a three year period. So who manages our investments? Well, you can see here, we use quite a number of managers. It's 15 in fact. We choose investment managers with different investment styles for diversification. And by investing this way, we can achieve higher investment returns for a given level of risk. Each of the managers shown specialises in a particular asset class. Global Infrastructure Partners, for example, in infrastructure. And you will hear in a few moments from Joe Blum about how the fund goes about in investing in infra infrastructure all over the world. So how have our managers performed over the last year? Well, if you compared to, came to this event in previous years, you'll recall that 2008-9 was a difficult year for the fund. The fund's investments fell by 21% that year, the global recession impacting on investment returns. But as you can see, the fund recovered strongly in 2009-10. The fund value increased by 32% that year, more than making up for the loss in the previous year. In 2010-11, the fund value continued to increase by 8.2%, outperforming its benchmark by 1.2%. And in 2011-12, the fund continued to rise and increase by 4.7%, again outperforming its benchmark by 1.2%. Now last year was a particularly good year for the fund. The fund increased in value by 14%, and that's outperforming its benchmark by 2.3%. Now pensions are a long-term investment, Therefore, we don't, don't need to have a knee-jerk reaction to falling markets. Some of our active members will not retire for another 30 to 40 years, so we have time to make investment returns, and as you can see, markets improve quickly. You can see here how the fund's portfolios have performed. We don't expect all our investment portfolios to perform well at a particular time, because managers perform well in different market conditions. But I wanted to show you this graph because it shows that 13 out of the 15 managers delivered positive returns in the last year. 
The two managers which produced negative returns were our infrastructure manager, but this was due to upfront fees being paid in the early years when few investments were made. But performance is now much more positive. Their annual return up until the 30th of June, as Joe will cover in his presentation, is 16.2% compared to their benchmark of 8.4%, so they're well above their target. Our European property manager produced negative returns due to the falls in capital values across Europe, as their returns were impacted by the continued European sovereign debt crisis. You can see that we got the highest returns from our investment in Japanese equities, rising by 24.3% in the year. Strong returns were also experienced by all the other fund's equity managers. Global equities increased by 24.1% and US and UK equities by over 20%. It is also reassuring that all of our bond managers delivered positive returns as well last year. So what has been the impact of the last year on the fund's value? Well, the fund continues to grow and increased in value by over £147 million last year to be valued at £1.23 billion. As at today's date, that figure is now 1.32 billion fund, 1.23 billion, and this is its highest level it's ever been. The fund has outperformed its benchmark by 2.3%, and this outperformance generated an additional 25 million pounds for the fund last year, and the value of investments increased by 14%. The fund benefited from the strong recovery in stock markets last year, and it also benefited for the high returns in Japanese equities and global equities as these were the two strongest performing asset classes. So what changes have we made uh, recently? Well, in 2012-13, our investment advisor, Aon Hewitt, in conjunction with officers and members, carried out a review with the structure of our fund to ensure that we are still investing in the right asset classes. Aon Hewitt received feedback from members at our annual training day in July and continual updates were provided at our quarterly uh, committee meetings where their recommendations were approved in November 2012. At this meeting it was decided to move from our regional equity managers, with the exception of our UK equity manager, into global equity managers. And this will give our managers much more freedom to invest in their best ideas globally rather than restrict them to specific regions. We also increase the equity am amount that's managed on a passive basis from 9% to 20%, which significantly reduced investment manager fees. In addition, we replace one of our hedge fund managers, whose long-term performance had been slightly below target, and we replace them with a new hedge fund manager. It is expected that all these changes will improve the overall return of the fund, maintain a similar level of risk within the fund, and also reduce investment manager fees by £2.2 million per annum. So where are our assets invested now? Well, the chart shows, following the tender exercise that we went through last year, that we've reduced the number of our managers from 15 to 13. The allocations to bonds, property, private equity and infrastructure all remain the same. So does our 10% allocation to hedge funds, but that has now been split 5% each, with BlackRock, is, who's one of our existing managers, and 5% to Brevin Howard, which is our new hedge fund manager, and this represents around about £63 million. The street strategic asset allocation to equities remains the same, it's still at 57% of the fund. We retained Majedi, which managed UK equities, and MFS, which already managed global equities for us, and they managed 8% each of the fund, which is around about 100 million each. We also appointed two new global active equity managers, Investec Asset Management and Harris Associates, and they will also manage 8% of the fund each, which is around about 100 million. In addition to this, legal in general have been reappointed to manage the passive equity allocation. So this has now been increased to 20% of the fund, which is around about £260 million. Now passive equity managers aim to track an index. So you'd see their returns. As the index, global indexes go up, the returns will go up in line with the index, and vice versa. If the index goes down, it'll go down with the, the, the index. Now this has saved us, this has saved us the majority of savings on our investment management fees because it is a lot 
they charge a lot less than our active equity managers. It is thought that over time, the split shown here is now likely to meet our investment objectives and maintain the high standards expected from Shropshire's investment managers. And scheme members sometimes ask about ethical investments. Understandably, this is something that does concern people and is important to individuals. The Shropshire Fund has given a lot of thought to this issue over the years, and we take this matter seriously. The Shropshire Fund does not restrict the companies in which our managers can invest, and some people ask why we don't do that. But the Fund has sought legal advice on this issue, and the overriding role of the committee is fiduciary. In other words, that means we must consider investment returns above everything else. However, the Fund is still made, able to make a difference, and it does this by influencing companies from the in, inside. We use F and C to actively engage with companies on the fund, fund's behalf. And in the last year, face-to-face -face meetings have been held with a wide range of companies to encourage them to consider their impact on the environment. The fund also believes that voting at annual meetings is important. In the last year, the Shropshire Fund voted at 137 UK company meetings and over 300 global company meetings. By voting at these meetings, we are able to express our views at the level of board independence and pay contracts for senior executives, for example. The Fund is also a member of the Local Authority Pension Fund Forum. 56 out of the 89 Local Authority Pension Funds are members of this forum, which represents 75% of local government pension funds by the value of assets. Now, this gives the forum real bargaining power when it talks to companies and influencing the way that they behave. So just to sum up then, the fund increased in value by 147 million last year and 13 out of the 15 portfolios delivered positive returns. And the fund outperformed the benchmark by 2.3% and this generated an additional 25 million pound for the fund. I will now hand over to Joe Blum from Global Infrastructure Partners who will run through the, the fund's infrastructure investments. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, my name is Joe Blum. I'm a partner at Global Infrastructure Partners. What I thought I would do is give you a brief overview of what Global Infrastructure Partners is, uh, then talk a bit about infrastructure investing and why we focus on infrastructure investing, and finally talk about your investment in GIP and how it's performed to date. Uh, GIP is a, uh, was founded in 2006. Uh, primarily by executives who came from Credit Suisse and General Electric. Uh, we currently have about $17 billion of assets under management, so it's quite a large fund. And we have two main funds, one that started in 2006, where we raised and invested $5.6 billion, and the other, uh, called GIP2, uh, which we raised and closed last year at $8.25 billion. And Shropshire County Council is an investor in GIP2. We have 92 professionals around the world. Our main offices are in London, New York, Sydney, uh, Colorado Springs, and Stamford, Connecticut. And we currently have 13 portfolio companies uh, that employ about 15,000 people worldwide. But a uh, broad overview of, of GIP. The, the question is why infrastructure investing? And I think let me start by just describing what infrastructure is, which I think most of you know. It's, it's things like roads and airports and ports, pipelines, power plants, uh, renewable energy, water companies, uh, and similar type of large uh, assets that provide uh, support for society. And from an investment point of view, there are a number of attributes of infrastructure uh, that we think are very, oops, yep, that are, that are very uh, useful in a portfolio uh, that supports pensions. And those attributes are typically high yields, so they generate quite a bit of yield, like bonds, uh, year to year. They have equity-like returns, meaning that they are consistent with growth companies. And they have moderate volatility, meaning they don't go up and down very much. So you see in a comparison with equities, bonds, and cash, infrastructure is on the right-hand side of that, uh, of that chart. 
And we invest in what are called mature infrastructure assets. That means assets that already exist. So Gatwick Airport, for example, which is one of our assets we own. City Airport, we own a number of pipelines. They're already existing mature assets. And they tend to have attributes such as a fairly high yield, five to 6% per year is what we target. They tend to have a medium amount of capital gains when we go to sell the company. They have moderate volatility and they have moderate liquidity. That means if we have to sell them, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not as easy as selling uh, stocks and bonds, but it is not a, a totally inflexible asset. So the um, investment characteristics of infrastructure are listed on this chart. First, they're obviously long-lived assets, meaning they go on for a very long time. A port or a road tends to have a life of 25 to up to 100 years. And it is not, therefore, subject to a lot of technological challenges. A lot of high-tech companies obviously can do very well, like BlackBerry, but then, of course, can have reversals when a new technology comes along. An airport tends to be somewhat monopolistic, doesn't change its character very much, and therefore tends to be a relatively stable investment. The second aspect is they tend to have fairly secure market positions. That is, there's not a lot of competition around. Whether it's an airport or a road, it tends to not generate a lot of competition and therefore has, uh, by definition, a, a protected environment in which to operate. The third is they tend to be inflation linked or inflation protected. So as prices go up, the value of the asset tends to rise, which is, can be uh, quite a bit different than bonds. Fourth, because they're almost monopolistic they're t and stable assets, they tend to be very relatively secure when markets get bad, so they don't go down a lot in value. So if you look at the 2008-2010 period, uh, Gatwick Airport, the valuation stayed relatively stable, even though we were in the middle of a significant recession. And the consequence of all that is they tend to be fairly un under-managed assets, so most infrastructure assets don't use industrial best practices. And that's, that's really the thesis of our fund, which is to take industrial best practices from our uh, DNA at, at General Electric and apply them to infrastructure assets so that we can improve the operation of those assets and, and thereby improve the value of the assets. So let me just talk a, a bit about the approach at GIP and how we approach infrastructure assets. We only invest in three areas uh, of infrastructure, that's energy, which tends to be pipelines, wind farms, power plants, oil storage facilities. Uh, transport, we own three airports in the UK, London City Airport, Gatwick and Edinburgh Airport, and waste and water. We don't have any investments in that area yet. And the reason we invest only in those three parts of the infrastructure spectrum is because that's where our areas of expertise are. We, toll roads are very good investments, but we don't have uh, any expertise in that area. And because we're a very large fund, we tend to take controlling positions, meaning we control the management of the companies we buy. And, and the thesis there is because we're trying to bring industrial best practices to those assets, by controlling the board, we're able to uh, control how the company operates. And we invest, invest globally, but only in uh, mature markets, such as North America, Europe, uh, UK, and Australia. So those are the areas where we invest. And then if you go down to the second half of the pages, our operating themes, what we try to do with those assets once we acquire them. And basically, we try to stretch for higher performance. Uh, we focus very much on customer service, efficiency, cash management, and we use a, a task tracker, something that very much a, a general electric technology of trying to make sure and follow the improvements that uh, we're focused on making in the companies. So the business characteristic is quite interesting to compare them to a lot of industrial companies. A lot of industrial companies are highly competitive. Uh, they're under continuous price pressure. Uh, they often have threats from other competitors. And that creates a culture of, uh, of improvement and continuous uh, improvement in services. Infrastructure, on the other hand, as I've described, has, tends to have limited competition, uh, tends to have fairly secure pricing, uh, above uh, inflation and has limited threats. And traditionally, that's meant that infrastructure assets have not been well ma managed and that there's been a culture of complacency. And we saw that when we acquired Gatwick Airport. It was owned by BAA. BAA owned uh, seven airports in the UK. 
Some were better managed than others, and certainly at Gatwick it was not well managed. And so what we've been able to do, what we've tried to do, is to improve the manage, management at Gatwick Airport. And we see that in quite a few infrastructure assets uh, worldwide. And, and how do we do that? What, is, what are the techniques that we use? Well, I've mentioned that our DNA really comes from General Electric, and they had a number of different things, uh, different uh, techniques in their so-called toolkit that are used to improve and enhance uh, operations. One is obviously customer service. The other is growth, to grow the company, to become much more efficient. efficient. They use uh, concepts such as Six Sigma, which is basically designed to reduce uh, deficiencies in service, and cash management. And it's interesting, if you look at the three airports that we acquired in the UK, how have we gone about doing that? Because airports, at the end of the day, are effectively conveyor belts of people, airplanes, and bags. And the question is how do you make that process more efficient? And one of the things we've done, for example, at Gatwick, is we've improved the security queues. So 95% of the time, you'll get through a security queue in five minutes or less. So the reason we focus so much on that is because people spend more money when they're through a security queue. The way we've analyzed it is for every six minutes you're on the other side, on the air side of a security queue, you spend an extra pound. We get half our revenue out of retail operations at Gatwick. So you're happier because you're not waiting in line. We're making more money and, you're, and our investors are getting a higher return on their investment. So we focus very much on that process of getting people through security queues quicker. And it's done in, a, in quite a fascinating way. I mean, it's, you're looking at the size of the baskets that you use to put your jackets in. In the wintertime, people take more through security queues than in the summertime. What is the optimal size of those baskets that we should use? Should you start on uh, putting things in baskets uh, well before you start going through the lines or at the lines. So some of the airports you see, you're, you're given a basket right before you're supposed to put it through the machine, which is a very, it tends to uh, create bottlenecks and delay your access uh, through the security queue. So that's what we focused on in Gatwick. At City Airport, when we took, we bought that in 2006, we found that the turnaround time for airplanes was over an hour. And we've been able to get that down to about 30 minutes per airplane. And that means getting the airplane in, cleaning it, getting people on board, and getting uh, and exiting uh, from from the terminal. So you're able to effectively double the use of the air of uh, the uh, airport by getting that quicker turnaround time at City Airport. And so that was one of the big focuses there. At Edinburgh Airport, the focus has been primarily on increasing growth. So we've gone out and gotten a number of new airlines through marketing to come into Edinburgh Airport, and that includes Turkish Airways. Air Canada, United Airways from the US, and we're working with the Middle East Airlines to come into uh, Edinburgh Airport. So that's really improved uh, the value of that airport. So it gives you a sense of the way we approach our investments uh, in infrastructure. So in short, just to sum up the way we look at infrastructure investment and how we do it, we, we, we take the characteristics of infrastructure investing, which is high barriers to entry, strong pricing power, low threats, limited technology change, but not necessarily good customer service, and we apply the industrial best practice techniques that I described to, to effectively achieve higher returns. And, and that's what we've been, been, been able to do, uh, certainly in our first fund. Finally, just to talk a bit about Edinburgh, so you can understand a bit of the, our rationale and how we look at investments and, and how we approach them. Um, what we saw in Edinburgh is a, the number one airport in Scotland. It's an unregulated freehold airport, so there's no government regulation, which gives us greater latitude in terms of the things that we can do with the airport. Uh, we also found that during the economic downturn in 2008 to 2010, uh, actually, the asset performed fairly well. People still continue to fly. Edinburgh is a very wealthy catchment area uh, and uh, is the number one uh, tourism uh, destination in Scotland, the number two in the UK. So it has a lot of good basic values from a stable uh, investment perspective. Uh, the big competition for Edinburgh is Glasgow Airport. Both of those were owned by BAA. Uh, the government forced the BAA to sell either Glasgow or Edinburgh. They decided to sell Edinburgh. And our view is that it's a better location than Glasgow, and it has a, a better catchment area because it's a wealthier area. And the, the, the theory, the approach that we took is to take what we learned at Gatwick Airport, what we learned at City Airport, take those people, move them up to Edinburgh to help 
improve the operations up there. And that's pretty much what we've done to date. Uh, and you see the, what we call the value added proposition, what we, were, what we focused on in Edinburgh. As I mentioned already, a lot was on growth, a lot was on getting new airlines. We've got a number of airlines to move from Glasgow Airport to Edinburgh Airport. We've increased the, uh, uh, inter the um, uh, uh, long haul flights out of Edinburgh. People, by the way, spend a lot more, certainly at the retail level, uh, on long haul than they do for uh, short haul flights, not surprisingly. We've got a new check-in process, uh, new retail, and we've put quite a bit of money into car parks because the car park offering at uh, Edinburgh was uh, quite poor. So we've improved the customer service, but we've also Im improved the value. So, uh, so from an investment perspective, that's uh, obviously very good. And uh, this is just a summation of, of, of the points I made of, of why we think Edinburgh is a good airport. And I, I focus on that because airports are generally easy to understand and also because it does explain a bit of how we approach our investments from an infrastructure investment. In terms of the future, we still have quite a bit. We have about $6 billion to invest over the next few years uh, in our second fund, the fund that uh, you're invested in. And we see a number of different themes out there. Um, in North America, energy is the big theme and a lot of that's driven by uh, fracking uh, and uh, renewables. In Europe, renewables is a main theme. Uh, there's a lot of offshore wind uh, that's being put up in the UK. We're looking at a number of investments in offshore wind in the UK. Uh, and that requires huge amounts of capital. And that capital comes from groups like ourselves. Uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, is also a byproduct of what's happening with the shale gas in the US. We're looking at a large investment in that in, uh, in the United States. Ports and terminals, as trade grows, there's more money that's necessary for ports. We see in the UK quite a new port, a number of ports being built um, that will want to be that will be sold uh, once they're uh, once they're constructed. And obviously, there's a funding gap from governments around the world into new infrastructure. So I mentioned we don't invest in greenfield, but new developments. But often, when those are built, uh, they are sold, and, and we would be there to buy them. So overall, that's that, that's generally our approach to infrastructure. What we've done in in your fund, GIP two. And uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to invest the remainder of our uh, committed capital and, and have similar returns that we've achieved so far. Thank you. Hello there. Um, my name's uh, James Walton. Uh, my job title at Shropshire Council is the Head of Finance, Governance and Assurance, uh, which basically means I'm the, I'm the Treasurer at Shropshire, County, uh, Shropshire Council um, and the Scheme Administrator for the Shropshire County Pension Scheme. Um, and I'm going to just do a few slides now just to talk through um, a couple of things. First thing is around the actuarial valuation. So this is the valuation that is undertaken um, every three years, um, looking at the, the value of the, uh, of the fund, looking at the difference between the assets and the liabilities and seeing what the impact is um, of the changes. So uh, 2010 was the last time that valuation was undertaken. The current one is as at 31st of March 2013 and we have some initial um, uh, results from that at the moment. Uh, the key questions that we look at in terms of that actual evaluation is, number one, how do our assets, which is the things that we've been talking about in terms of the, the investment returns, how do they compare to uh, the liabilities that we have, and what impact does that have on the contributions that, uh, that each of the employers need to make into that scheme to keep things uh, balanced. So. Just to, uh, just to give a bit of an, an intro in terms of um, the way the scheme is funded, uh, on the right you have the member benefits, that's all the benefits, the, the payments that we make out in terms of the, uh, the pensions uh, payments, and the, the funding for that comes in on the left, and there's three major sources for that. There is the um, employee contributions, which is between 5.5% and 7.5% of people's pay that goes in, that goes into the scheme. There's then the employer contributions, which is what each of the employers pay on top of that, that goes in. And then we have all of the investment returns uh, made from investing that money in all the things that Justin talked about earlier, and all those things go in. And ideally, what you want is that all of those funds going in balance out with the payments that are, that are due to go out in the future. Um, and that gives you an indication then of uh, whether your scheme is fully funded or not. 
just look at this um, th this slide for a second. This is just around uh, what's changed since 2010. So the, the valuation done in 2010, uh, there are some key elements that have moved uh, since then. So the first part is around market conditions. Now this is um, the way in which the deficit, sorry, the way in which the liabilities um, are valued. Um, and the market conditions, what we look at there is um, the valuation of the, of the liabilities using uh, gilts. Uh, and because gilt yields are at a, a historically low level at the moment, what that does is it increases the value um, of the, the liability, which in itself increases the, the value of the, the deficit. So the pressure then on the deficit increases, the pressure on the contribution rate that employers would make increases. Um, to counteract that, we then have the investment returns, and as Justin uh, talked about earlier, uh, we've had a, a good year, a good few years in terms of the, uh, the investment returns, so they have a downward pressure on that deficit and in themselves put a downward pressure on in terms of the contribution rate. So that gets a little smiley face on that one. The life expectancy, so this is how long people are um, living um, within the pension fund, uh, gets a sad face, but what it's actually is saying is people are living longer, um, which, is, which is good news for individuals, but obviously uh, means that their pensions are being drawn for longer, uh, which increases the deficit and therefore puts pressure on the contribution rate. Um, member experience. This is looking at things like um, the uh, the membership of the scheme, which is increasing, which is good. Um, it's looking at things like uh, how many ill health payments, those sort of out of the uh, the, the, the standard uh, payments are being made. Um, what we're finding with those is is that that's actually um, that those are those are better for the scheme. Um, so since 2010, uh, again, slight downward pressure in terms of those contributions. That one gets a smiley face. Um, LGPS 2014, and, and Debbie will talk about this in a bit more detail um, in a moment. Um, so this is looking at the way the, the changes that we've made from from uh, from 1st of April 2014, which looks at things like career average uh, calculations for pensions um, and revising the accrual rates. When you take those into account, overall in terms of the deficit, it doesn't have a huge impact. But in terms of the national picture, what it does is it has a, a downward pressure on employer contribution rates. So that's helpful from that point of view. But when you look at it all together overall, the overall impact is that it's, it's, it's negative from the point of view of the pension fund. So taking that into account, we then get the preliminary, preliminary figures in terms of um, the funding levels and the contribution uh, rates uh, between 2010 and 2013. So in 2010 we had an 81% funded scheme, which basically means the value of the assets were 81% of the value of the liabilities at that point in time. Because of all the things that was talked about on the previous uh, page, when we look at the position as at 31st of March 2013, we're actually 76% funded on that basis, that's what it's looking like, which is obviously um, a, a reduction. Now, what do we do about that deficit? How do we recover that deficit? Well, we've currently got plans in place um, to recover that deficit over a 19-year um, period, and on that basis we have overall um, employer contribution rates of 17.5%. Um, within our uh, funding strategy statement, we are actually um, able to uh, recover that deficit over up to 25 years. However, if we stick at recovering over the 19 years, that would increase the employer contribution rate across the whole schemes. So this is for all of the, uh, the uh, employers on average. It would increase from 17.5% to 22%. Uh, that's not the end of the, the story. There's still things we can do along that, uh, around that. For example, increasing the repayment period. But just on the basis of, of what we're seeing at the moment, that's the, uh, that's the, the, the result. So where does that leave us? Well, what we haven't got yet is the comparative data um, for all of the 2013 revaluations, because the, the actual revaluation 2013 happens across the, uh, across the country for all the pension funds. Um, but using the data that we have from 2010, which should be a good proxy for um, where we are at the moment, uh, what this graph is showing is the, um, the, the funding level, so our 81% uh, at that point, and you can see the amber line in the middle um, is, is the, the average um, uh, funding level, and we're significantly to the, to the left of that um, at, uh, at the 81%, so we're a well-funded scheme from that point of view, and there's about 40 different authorities there which are comparable authorities uh, in that comparison. So that's the one element. The other element is around the um, contribution rate. Uh, and if we look at that across, um, across the same comparators, again, average in the middle, the amber bar is getting up towards 20%, and our 17.5% um, is um, one, of the, one of the lowest in the country on that basis. 
Um, so if we then move on to look at um, what's happened in terms of the assets and liabilities over the uh, over the period, what this graph is showing, if you look first of all at the blue uh, the blue line, that shows the value um, of the, uh, the 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 fund value, that's the assets effectively. Um, between the period March 2000 uh, and up to date, and you can see that generally those uh, the value of those um, assets has grown over that period. Uh, there was a dip down in 2000 and 2003, and then a major collapse in terms of um, 2008, 2009. Um, but overall, if you took a trend over that period, you'd see that the uh, the fund is growing, and every time there is a dip, it then recovers uh, quite quickly. So, fund value. 500, uh, around about 500 million at its lowest point there in March 2003, now at over 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds. So that's all good news, um, but then when you take into account the red bars, which is the valuation at each of the three years um, of the liabilities, um, you can see that in March 2001, at the valuation there, uh, the value of the, uh, the fund was in excess of what was anticipated to be the value of the liabilities. So exactly, we're actually 108% funded at that point in time. So then, despite assets uh, growing over the, uh, the, the, the following uh, 12 years, um, when you get to March 2013, you can see that the, the current valuation in terms of those liabilities um, is significantly um, in excess um, <coughs> of, the, um, uh, of the, the fund value. So why are the, um, the liabilities increasing in that way? Well, the major driving factor, as I mentioned earlier, um, is around uh, bond yields. So when we're looking at valuing those liabilities going forward, and we talk about people drawing their pensions in the next 20, 30, 40 years, um, we use uh, gilt yields to, uh, to, as, as the basis for valuing those liabilities. And if the gilt yield is low, then the the, uh, the value of the liabilities is high. And as you can see, since 2010, there is a, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the red line at the bottom, which shows it most clearly, you can see that gilt yields has reduced, and that has a direct impact on the value of the liabilities. Since the valuation date, which was pretty much the lowest point um, for the yields, it's then started to go back up. If we actually valued the fund and, and the, the, the liabilities based on, say, the end of, no, uh, end of, end of August, with that upward trend, the fund would actually be 82% funded, which is slightly better than it was in, in 2010. Um, but obviously, it's volatile, and what we have to do is take those lines in the sand every three years to produce the valuation. But it does mean we have some flexibility um, around uh, how we deal with the deficit. Um, but just that change in terms of those, um, those gilt yields has added £238 million to our liability calculation uh, since 2010. So the other thing that's hit um, liabilities um, is in terms of uh, members living longer. Um, so again, you can see there in 20 uh, 2010 uh, 20 and 2013 for each of the uh, for male and female categories um, that uh, there's been a significant increase in longevity um, for scheme members um, over the three years, and that adds to our um, liabilities. So to give an idea and a measure of how these liabilities um, compare to something uh, like uh, the, the payroll that, uh, within the pension fund, uh, this graph just shows some anonymised data across the, across the country, which just gives an idea of the first bar in each case. This is 16, 17 different employers. Um, the, the first bar is showing um, the gearing ratio. Um, between um, the, the, the deficit and the payroll in 2010, and the second bar is the same again in 20, um, 2013. Now you can see in all cases uh, the deficit compared to the payroll has increased significantly. Um, in Shropshire, um, we're, we're sitting quite, um, quite average in terms of, the, uh, of, of that position. Um, our deficit in 2010 compared to our payroll was around about 100%, so the value of the payroll and the value of the deficit were about equal. Um, in 2013, that's increased to 185%. So it's probably closest to employer eight uh, uh, on the graph, uh, but that, that, that isn't us. Uh, but it just gives, it, it's a marker that we can use to see uh, whether the deficit is actually um, controlled and uh, within reasonable levels. So if we quickly just look at um, uh, scheme uh, membership um, over the last few years, so this is back to 2007, so over the last six years, you'll see that overall membership is, uh, is increasing and it's, it's, it's um, continuing to increase. Uh, if you look at each of the individual coloured bars, um, 
uh, as, a, as a trend, uh, you can see that the, the red bars, uh, the number of active full-time members is uh, steadily decreasing. Um, the active part-times have shown a steady uh, increase, like for the last year, um, and deferred has, has increased over the period. As it stands at the moment, um, there are around 37,000 members within the scheme at the moment, so it's a, it's a healthy um, uh, scheme in terms of numbers. So, just a quick slide in terms of um, dispelling a few uh, a few myths. Um, we like to put this one up because it um, uh, people talk about gold-plated um, pensions within uh, uh, local uh, government and within the public sector as a whole. Um, Lord Hutton uh, has undertaken a, a report which was a. Um, a report was produced in March 2011 and one of the things that he found from that and he stated quite publicly uh, was there aren't gold plated uh, pensions within uh, within local government um, and the average pension they're actually paying out is £4,400 uh, a, a year. So to sum up in terms of um, the, the valuation, what we have is a high performing fund with around about, uh, fund level around about 76%, as I say, you can very quickly and easily move that to 82% if you just uh, change the, uh, the move, move the date forward a little bit and take those gilts into account. Um, we have very low uh, employer contribution rates, there's pressure to increase that, uh, but that, that, can be, uh, that can be managed to up, up to a point. Um, scheme members are, are living longer, which is, uh, which is great news for of you guys, not so much for for us at this side of the, of the room, but there you go. Um, and the uh, and and the fund the fund value uh, in terms of those investments, extra 147 million was added in uh, just in the last year. So. Um, just a little bit now around the uh, the call for evidence um, on the future for the local government um, pension scheme. Um, this is uh, links into uh, Lord Hutton's um, final uh, report. Uh, where a number of recommendations were made and then consultation was launched um, in terms of things around um, co cooperative working between different um, authorities, looking to see whether uh, administration efficiencies can be found. There are 89 pension funds um, around the country, um, and so logic would suggest, well, if you had less than 89, there would, there would be um, efficiencies within that one way or another. So that's the basis for starting the, uh, the consultation. What questions did it ask? Well, it talked around uh, some high-level objectives. Um, how do we deal with the, the deficits across the country? Um, and how can we improve investment returns? They were the two major um, objectives, but then behind that there were things like uh, can we reduce investment fees? Obviously, fees are part of the uh, the investment returns that we uh, that we that we net off. Um, can we reduce in improve things like um, flexibility within strategies. Um, so there's, there's quite a few things in there as, as secondary objectives. Um, so starting with the dealing with the, uh, uh, the, the, the deficits, one thing that was looked at was around um, is there consistent measurement uh, of the deficits. Now because each of the 89 pension funds have their own actual actuarial valuations, Mercer's do ours, there are different companies that do different uh, pension schemes. They will all have different measures, different assumptions that they make within their, uh, their valuations. So if you have inconsistency across those 89, it's very difficult to see what the size of the problem is on a national basis. Um, and one of the things that you would look at is the outliers. So this would be those, those funds that perhaps because of some of the assumptions that have been made appear to be very well funded or very poorly funded and then outside, the, uh, outside the pack from that point of view. Um, the pensions regulator is asking questions around are funding plans uh, credible, are the repayment periods that we talk about in terms of the deficits, are they, are they uh, reasonable? Um, dangers there around using high discount rates, talked about the gilt yields, if you start um, uh, fiddling around with the, uh, with the discount rates too much you can again make your, make your um, pension fund look like it's more fully funded um, and there's, there's dangers around not covering the interest on the deficit, deficits there, interest accrues on it um, on an annual basis. Um, what I would say is our um, our uh, valuers tend to be very prudent in their approach. So the valuation that we have put on our uh, scheme is a very st um, steady, robust valuation, I would suggest. Um, as I mentioned before, let's talk about merging funds. You can merge funds and you put them all together. All it does is it makes one big deficit or a number of bigger deficits rather than a lot of smaller deficits. It doesn't make the deficit go away. So that still needs to be worked on. But in terms of that question of should we merge funds, it seems logical. But when you actually look at the evidence, what this slide is showing is 
um, the, 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 where the red line across the, or across the middle is showing an average return over five years of around about 3% on, on, um, on pension fund. And what it shows is, is that on the left hand side you have a pension fund um, highlighted there with 300 million, which can make uh, a return of just over uh, 3% over five years. And over on the right hand side you've got a fund significantly larger at £8 billion, or so one of the largest uh, pension funds, um, and within that they made a return of around about 3% over five years. So the data doesn't actually suggest that merging funds together and having uh, a, a smaller number of bigger funds would actually generate high returns. And you can actually see from that those areas where the highest returns tend to be at the smaller end of the, uh, of the scale. So, in summary, in terms of the um, uh, LGPS and the call for evidence, um, there isn't evidence that, that larger schemes are uh, performing better. There is, across the country, a general underperformance. Um, the, the benchmark has been missed by around about 1% on the basis points um, over the last, uh, last seven years. Um, when we're looking at returns, we need to be looking at um, uh, not necessarily short-term gain, but those longer-term consistent returns over a long period of time. Um, when you look at the, the top 10 funds um, across, the, across the country, uh, what you find is they tend to have a few managers, a small number of managers, um, 12 on average. As Justin said, we've um, adjusted as we have 13. Um, they tend to be low manager turnover. Uh, as, as Justin said earlier, we have just actually gone through and changed a number of our pension fund managers. Um, but those managers uh, that we're, we're keeping have been with us for a long time, and those ones that we, we moved, we, we'd had for quite a long time as well. So it is low manager turnover, it's not no manager turnover. Um, uh, there, there's this. Um, Within the best performing funds, there is a t there tends to be simple structures in terms of the way that the pension fund is put together, um, and there tends to be some internal management being done within the scheme. Uh, obviously, Shropshire is quite a small scheme in terms of the, the number of staff we have, so we have a small, only a small amount of, uh, of internal management on that basis. But we need to look um, at uh, there's this things like more uh, information in terms of where international uh, pension funds are going that will give us a, a better idea uh, and more evidence in terms of um, uh, where we can improve things in the future. So to sum up, um, what have we done in terms of the, uh, the consultation responses? Uh, we submitted our response at the end of um, September, that went in, um, and talked about what we thought was the, the, the best responses from Shropshire. Um, what have we done? We've also gone through, and in terms of that restructuring that, um, that we talked about earlier, uh, changing our pension fund managers, um, we've reduced fees on an annual basis by about £2.2 .2 million, and not insignificant sum, but you have to keep that in mind compared to the £147 million that was generated last year. Um, where we are at the moment is those consultation responses have gone in and um, uh, the, uh, the government are currently looking at those submissions, uh, are looking to gather further data and information, uh, and will be coming back with their proposals in terms of what happens with pension funds uh, going forward in the future. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Debbie, and she'll just talk you through uh, in more detail the 2014 um, LGPS scheme. Thank you, James. Um, I'm Debbie Sharp, and me and the team look after your benefits. So anybody in the room that is a member of the pension scheme, we look after paying your benefits, collecting your money, looking after your employers, hopefully communicating everything that you need to know, um, and hopefully you find the documentation that we do send out to you useful. What we're going to cover today is, uh, first of all, the changes from the 2014 scheme and then another couple of changes that are coming along from the revenue and just how we're going to communicate and keep you up to date with what's going on. The 2014 scheme coming in next April affects active members, so anybody who's an employee who's in the pension scheme at the end of March, stays in employment in April, will transfer into the 2014 scheme. 
What won't be affected is anybody who's actually left because their benefits would have been calculated under the rules at the time of the date of their leaving. So deferred members, which are what we classify members who've left but are not drawing their benefit yet, they won't be affected and any pensioner members in the audience, your benefits won't be affected either. So it's just active members, employees who will transfer from one scheme to, to the other. So what's actually new in the new scheme? Um, you heard mention earlier, James said one of the changes is changing it from a final salary scheme to what's known as a career average revalued earnings scheme, a care scheme as they refer to it a lot in the press. Um, and this is what saves the, the fund going forward uh, around about sort of 1% of employer contributions because in the long term it is meant to be more cost effective for a pension fund than the final salary scheme that we've been operating for a while. What doesn't change is that it's still a defined benefit scheme. So the benefits are still based on salary and they're still based on service. They're just not based on a final salary for any service from 2014 onwards. Any service that anybody has in the scheme up to next March, so under the current scheme rules, and if you had and you've been around as long as I have, got scheme um, service in previous rules, you might have benefits based on 80th. You might have benefits based on 80th with a lump sum. In the current scheme, we have benefits based on 60th with no lump automatic lump sum. Those benefits are still going to be calculated under those scheme rules and still under a final salary. So going forward, we will have benefits calculated still as final salary if we've got pre-2014 service, but any of our service going forward will transfer into the new scheme and be based on career average, so it will be based on our salary each year. What is happening to take account of that is the build-up rate of the pension is actually going to be slightly better. It's going to a 49th instead of a 60th at the moment. So. If you did come into the pension scheme in your middle teens and stayed through till the almost you know, late 60s, you could actually build up 49 years. So then you would end up with a salary, a pension that was almost 100% of your salary over your lifetime average. But we don't tend to have nowadays a lot of long serving members. Um, the average of the benefits are usually built up more around the 10 years. Um, so we won't have many people on 100% of their pay, I don't think. What is also changing is normal pension age. In the pension scheme at the moment, that's 65, but in the new scheme, it's going to change to mirror the state pension age. And there are changes coming afoot in the state pension age as well that's increasing that from age 65. So any changes in the state pension now will be mirrored in our scheme. So they've moved my pension age, uh, and you'll see in a later slide what that sort of is going to affect people. Another option, a new, um, Alternative for people, should anybody not be able to afford the contributions in the pension scheme, at the moment they have to leave it. So if um, times get hard, they can't afford to pay into the pension scheme, only option is to not be in it. But in the new 2014 scheme, there's a 50-50 option, which is going to give people the chance to pay half of the contribution. And for the time they reduce their contribution rate down to half, they'll get half a benefit. That's just for the pension that they're buying. All of the other add-ons, life cover, spouses benefits, dependents benefits, will still stay as full as they are at the moment. But you have this option now, so hopefully if somebody's having to put um, children through university, having to perhaps take on a care bill at some point in time, that we may not lose members that they could, if they were struggling, perhaps just reduce to a half-rate contribution now, instead of leaving completely. And the other thing that's changing is contribution rate. At the moment, that's always been based on people's full-time pay. So a part-timer would always have to pay the same rate as a full-timer, even though they're only accruing a smaller benefit. In the new scheme, the contribution rate will be based on what they're actually earning. So that's changing as well. You'll see here that what's changing too is the amount of contribution bands. So at the moment, we have seven bands. And you'll see those over on the 
right hand side. 2014 scheme is introducing two new bands, so it's increasing it to nine. Uh, one of the biggest changes you'll see if you can read the bottom of the right hand side there is that the contribution rates for the higher earners is increasing. So you'll see instead of just going between five and a half and seven and a half percent in the new scheme, their range is from five and a half to twelve and a half percent. And the thoughts behind that are to equalise out the actual net contributions pay. The higher earnings uh, tend to get, um, they're paying tax at a higher rate, which means their tax relief on their contributions is also at a higher rate. So actually the net cost to them can end up being less than it does for a lower earner. So it's meant to take into account that tax relief. So you'll see there, um, if it affects yourself, you might be able to spot whether you're going to be better off or worse off. What's new in ill health retirement? The actual ill health uh, retirement, the enhancements, isn't changing. But what is changing is that qualifying service, someone's going to have to be in employment in the pension scheme for two years to get an ill health benefit. Currently, they only need to be in for three months. Um, so people are going to have to make their decisions and won't have the opportunity as they do now. Should they know that they may need to be calling on a benefit, they can quickly rejoin the pension scheme and it doesn't take long to get your entitlement back, whereas now you've got to be in the scheme for two years. Um, the enhancements are staying the same under the new scheme, but what is different is the, change, the description of normal pension age, because that's changing to the state pension age, then for some people they may find that their enhancement um, will be more than it was before because their state pension age has changed. Early retirement, this is a new one in the fact that you can early retire, you can draw your benefits before 60 without having to have your employer's consent, which you can't do at the moment. If you decided to do that, you do take a reduction to the benefits, but it's your choice. It gives you more choice of planning your own retirement and deciding what you want to do with your benefits. You'll see from here, though, if you do want to retire early and take up that option, this is the current table that we've got. You'll see we're missing a few factors at the bottom because if state pension age is changing to 66, um, 67 through to 68, we're actually short of some factors. So we think they will be introducing a new table um, and that might take account of what James is saying again about longevity. We're living longer, benefits are payable for longer, so they may choose to change the um, the factors but if anything like this changes this is one of the things that we try to get out to you in a newsletter we will always try and make sure we're communicating to you exactly what's going on but it does give more choice so normal pension age you'll see there um, if you go on to the DWP website uh, these will be on the website afterwards so you can pick up the links uh, they'll have all of the factors on there and the age, the dates of birth and of when people are actually changing their state retirement age. You'll see there it's already in law of when it's going to change to sort of go from 67 and then to 68, but they're also talking about bringing that in in an earlier time frame. So at the moment we'll just keep you updated, but this now affects the time. If you're a current member in our scheme and you're still in the scheme next April, this is going to affect your benefits out of our pension scheme. What there is, though, when the, um, the government announced that the public sector schemes were going to be looked at, were going to be changed, because this, remember this isn't just affecting local government. Um, you've seen uh, all the, the aspects about the strikes for the fire, the teachers. They're all having to have their pension schemes changed. We change a year earlier. Um, but anybody who was within 10 years of retirement age when the announcements were made back in 2012, there was a guarantee spoken about that actually you wouldn't be any worse off. So what's come into our scheme at the moment is that there's going to be a bit of a protection, small underpin, that if you fit into that category up there, so you were within 10 years of uh, age 65 back in 2012, and you retire at 65 or beyond, your benefits will be guaranteed to be no worse than they were. So it could be better because a new scheme may give you a better benefit, but if for any reason it doesn't, we would have to calculate what you would have had in the old scheme and you'll get that. The um, not before there, you'll see just underneath, at the moment in the regulations, it does say someone has to get the underpin, they have to retire 
um, work through to 65 or beyond. But I've just understood from last week that the unions may have had um, a win on this and may have actually got the government to agree that if somebody is in that... Um, within 10 years of retirement, that if they decide to go at 60, 61, 62, that they would also keep the underpin. So again, we'll update you if that actually gets changed before next year. This one just shows you the effect of the contribution rate change. So for somebody who's actually changing their hours, um, if currently, if they were half time, if they went half time and they were earning 22,000, they would just stay in the six and a half percent band rate. They wouldn't have any change to the amount that they were actually paying in, contri in, in the percentage. In the new scheme, they would. They would. You'd see there they actually pay a percentage less. So because their salary is half, they'll change bands and they will pay less than they were paying before. What's staying the same? You'll see from here, you're still going to get the option to take a lump sum. That's not being taken away from us. We can still give up pension. One pound of pension will give you a lump sum. So you can still make um, arrangements for your new car or your big, you know, big holiday, pay off your mortgage. Um, you can take that as a tax-free lump sum, still tax-free, and again, anything ever changed on that, we'd make sure we let you know. Death and service lump sum, people don't always realise um, that they have got this sort of life insurance cover. Life insurance covers there whilst you're in service, and then also guarantees to be paid for up to 10 years after retirement as well, if you retire at 65. Death in service survivor benefits, not being taken away, still there, not changing the calculation on them, staying exactly the same. Ill health provision, still going to have the enhancements of tier one, tier two. What you will see there then, the change in the normal pension age can actually mean that should somebody have to finish on health grounds, they're actually going to have a better enhancement because it will be enhancing through to their normal pension age. And if that is beyond 65 now, then that actually benefits them in this instance. <laughs> Um, tier 3 is staying, we did wonder whether they would take that out, that's just a temporary payment of a benefit, it's only sort of in for the maximum of three years, but that's meant to be when somebody can't do their job at the moment, but with treatment it's seen that within three years they're going to be able to take on employment again, so that's staying. And redundancy and efficiency, the early payment from age 55 should your employer terminate your contract, that's still in, that hasn't disappeared, still the guarantee that your benefits will be paid. This is just to show people what the pension account will look like. You no longer got the final salary, so we're no longer just looking at your service and your pay at leaving, multiplying it by a fraction, giving you a benefit. You will have um, a pension account that builds up year on year now. We look at what the salary is, we'll provide a pension, and then when it becomes payable, it will be increased. So you'll see at the end there, each line gets increased by whatever the inflation is since it was purchased, and then you're given a pension at the end of the day. The annual benefit statements will start showing, um, not from next year, it'll be the year after, then they'll start showing pension accounts in this way. And what you will need to ensure is that look at them. Some people have a look at it, might put it straight in the drawer. We hope not, but have a look at it because, because your benefits are going to be based on your pay in that year. You need to check that we have been given your correct pay by your employer. It's no longer that you've just got to, as long as we've got your hours or if you're full time, your service is just clicking up and adding on to your account. This is now going to be purchased each year. So if we've got the wrong information from your employer, you're only going to have in the legislation six years to actually query that. So I think that's just the one thing. If you do take away from, from this, from next year, it's going to be very important that you make sure that my team have been given the right information from your employer. We're working with employers at the moment. We had a training session last Friday, so to make sure that, that all of their systems are capable of doing what they need to do. But I think there is also an onus on yourself to make sure your benefit is correct. Um, so we're still waiting some of the, the documentation, some of the guarantees, some of the transitional protection. So those will come in. James has mentioned there we've got other things going on in the background about collaborations, super funds. Um, it used to be that pensions didn't change, but I don't think you come to one of these annual meetings now and we've, uh, we've never got nothing to tell you about a change. So uh, it all keeps going. So what to expect from us, communications as usual, no matter whether you are a deferred member, a pensioner member, active member, we are communicating with you the best that we can, we hope. So you'll usually get updates, those could be in hard copy, they may be electronic now. Um, 
what we're trying to do is we're updating the website at the moment because of course we're running the current scheme but we need to let you know about the 2014 scheme so there are two different links there now so you get the current information but you can also go through to a separate site on the 2014 changes and we're going to have a new website that will go live next April so just updating everything for you any videos that we get the LGA we contribute to the local government association and of course they have a little pensions unit so they can invest in putting together some um, documentation or videos so as employers can use them so we're going to load those up onto the website so it might be worthwhile if you want to keep abreast of the changes make sure you go onto the Shropshire County Pension Fund site and that's where you'll pick up everything first hand um, you can always come and see us at the Guildhall. We can do presentations around the county at your employers if there's enough of you that um, want us to come and see you. And we'll just keep, up, keep updating the leaflets and the guides for you. We're hoping um, that on the new site there'll be more self-service so people can go in, look at their own records, look at those pension accounts, put in some modellers for you. So if you think of changing your hours, what's changing at your job, then you can go in and you can actually have a look at what that change would do to your benefit. At the moment, 1,600 users do go in and have a look at their benefits online, so we're hoping and pushing for more people to, um, to use that facility. And because we're collecting more and more email addresses, then currently we are trying to use that as a vehicle to get the neat leaflets, the newsletters to you, because it just cuts down our cost. And as James said, what we're trying to do is make sure that the fund, the administration, costs less, we can invest more, and then hopefully keep the employer contribution rate down. I just mentioned before, just touching on revenue changes as well as the actual scheme changes. Remember, we're also ruled by sort of customs and revenue as to how we can have to tax the benefits. And this is just to bring into a, um, uh, to everybody's consciousness, really, that the limits that the revenue puts in place are changing from next year. The lifetime allowance is quite a high limit. And as you'll see from that slide, you have to have quite a large pension to get caught by it. But it may affect people, and of course it may affect people that my team may not be aware of because you may have earnings, pensions from other places as well. So we can only ever tell you what our life, you know, your, your lifetime allowance is in our, our fund. So just make sure you're aware of your whole of your pension entitlement and that the lifetime allowance reduces next year from 1.5 million to 1.25 and there is also a change in how much you can increase your pension pot in one year that's going to uh, reduce from 50,000 to 40,000. 40,000 sounds a lot but in our scheme it isn't because if somebody's got quite a lot of service it's not the amount of contribution that goes in so we don't have to put 40,000 pound in in pounds it's actually the value of the increasing that benefit that year so as if people have got lots of service with a final salary scheme you can quite easily get to 50,000 so I think it's just being aware of that. If somebody's having a pay, a pay rise, a promotion, just check with us whether it could incur any tax for you. The last thing I wanted to just um, end with is because of the changes in employment going on and changes um, in how contracts are being let or run, just to remind you that in local government, especially if you're employed by the main councils, there is legislation in place that there's pension protection for you that your employer will be looking to put in place for you if you're being transferred out to a new contractor. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a reintroduction or an update on the fair deal, which is the sort of um, the rules that are in place for the public sector scheme, so everything outside of LG, that also encompasses academies now, so they're under the same rules as principal civil service or national health service. Um, so there is protection there. So if you're looking at your service is going to be delivered by somebody else, remember to ask the questions of what's happening with my pension. And that's all I wanted to cover today. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Well, I think we've had um, four interesting talks there. Are there any questions on on any any subject that, uh, to do with pensions? Ah. <coughs> Why are valuations only done every three years? The uh, 
This is in terms of just managing the uh, the, the, the the process. It's quite a long uh, process that needs to be undertaken. So, in terms of the administration in doing evaluation, it started at the start of this year um, and goes on for quite a long period of time. There's quite a lot of, uh, of of cost and time and resource that goes into that. So, as a marker to look at the value of the assets compared to liabilities. Um, to do that on a three-year base, triannual, triannual basis, um, seemed to the, 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 the most appropriate um, a, approach to ensuring that we do that valuation, we do it properly, uh, and we keep a, an, an ongoing assessment um, for the years uh, ahead. So you wouldn't want to do it more uh, regularly than three years because it would cost uh, too much in the administration involved. And if you took a longer period, then potentially you'd be, um, you'd be going a longer period before you worked out whether things were going uh, significantly awry or, or increasing or getting better or whatever. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, as the valuation was started in the beginning of the year, um, and obviously the Mercers had the figures that were available at that time as to where you were going for the future. Due to the fact that the council has changed direction quite considerably many times since then, um, how accurate is the, the evaluation? And also, um, in view of the decreasing number of staff, etc., and if you become an enabling authority, how many people will stay in the fund? And is there a possibility at some time of us facing a Detroit type situation where the council goes bankrupt? And what would the effect of that be? <laughs> there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of questions there. Um, uh, yes, the, uh, the, 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 the local authority uh, is undergoing a lot of change um, at the moment uh, and has changed a lot since, um, well, over the last, the last sort of six months, 12 months, two years, three years, and will continue to change in the, in, in the future. Um, obviously, Shropshire Council is only one of the employers within the, uh, within the pension fund. Um, and the, uh, the, the way that the calculations um, are done, the calculation that was done at the end of March was based on the information that we had at that point in time. What, what you need to distinguish between is evaluation is done at that three-year period, um, but in terms of what does this mean in terms of employer contributions and, and um, what do we do in terms of dealing with the deficit, well, that's where you then step away from that point and you say, okay, well, uh, what are the things that um, we think are actually... Um, uh, outside of that of that valuation at the time. So, for example, there will be assumptions around uh, pay increases um, over the over the period. There will be assumptions around uh, how many employees uh, the authority has now and ha will have in the future, um, and, and a whole number of variables. So, a number of those will be taken into account at the time of the valuation, and a number of those we can then say, well, that's a reasonable basis for the valuation. But in terms of what we're going to do in terms of employer contributions, this is this is what we think is a reasonable um, take on that. So, for example, we could say uh, we have a 19-year repayment period for the deficit. We could increase that uh, beyond that. The evaluation at the time will, will take into account what would happen on the, by continuing the existing policy. Um, what we've done as a local authority in, in Shropshire um, is we've looked at uh, the deficit and the repayment of that deficit over a period of time, and we've allocated a, a cash value to repaying that deficit over the next 19 years. Um, so with staff coming and going, that doesn't actually impact on the value or, or the repayment of that deficit. So what we need to make sure is, is that the current active employees that are paying their contributions are paying enough to cover their liability going forward, and then we have effectively a separate pot, which we then increase on a different basis. Basis, um, which goes into repaying that deficit over the future period. And we have some flexibility about whether we pay that off in five years, 10 years, 19 years, 25 years, or, or whatever we need. So it's, it's trying to keep a, a, a balance between what's happening over here within the council and what's happening over here within the pension fund. Um, and it's about just trying to keep those two things balanced down so we don't have huge increases or decreases in terms of the contribution rates, but we're also not over or underfunding the, uh, the pension fund. Okay. Any more questions? Ah, gentlemen there. You didn't finish the uh, question on the on the Detroit type situation. Is there any possibility in the future of the council going bankrupt? And if um, so, what would the situation be for the fund? We, um, I, I, 
I don't. Well, I, I don't believe the, bank, the council will be going bankrupt. We are. Um, we're putting everything in place to ensure that we are. Um, we have a, a balanced budget uh, as an authority. Uh, we have quite a reasonable level of cash balances um, at the moment, uh, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that um, that we wouldn't go into that into that situation. If we were getting close to that situation, then I would be flagging that up with members. Okay. Uh, my question uh, r relates to. Um, the, the, the amount of money that people are contributing to the pension. I mean, first of all, as an observation, I think uh, the uh, returns that we've got on this year are, are great, so that, that's a very positive thing. But alongside the returns of the investments that we've got, you also need people to be paying into the pension scheme. Uh, my worries are, having spoken to a couple of people who are considering their options, we've been subject to uh, you know, a three-year pay freeze, and the uh, uh, current employed members have also been subject to a 5.4% pay cut over the last two years. And a lot of people are thinking about what they can do to improve their income, and some of them are thinking about pulling out of the pension scheme, at least for the time being, until times get a bit better. And I just wondered whether or not you'd notice that, whether and, and how many people are likely to take up the half contribution rate when it becomes available in April, and what that m will mean to the fund in the long term. Um, I'll, I'll pick that one up, only because we do uh, keep an eye on the percentage of employees that are two main employers, so Telford and Reakin and, and Shropshire Council, um, to have a look at the number of employees they've got that are eligible to be in the pension scheme against the number that are actually in. And we haven't seen a big change in that recently. Um, we're over the sort of uh, the whole of the country, there's only been historically sort of a 70-75% take-up rate of local government pension scheme anyway, and at the moment we're still staying in the early 70s, but we do keep an eye on that on a monthly basis, so if, if we start to see a change, then we'll also be reporting that to, uh, to committee. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, the lady at the top there. I'd just like to know if there are any um, restrictions on AVCs as a pension member. Okay. Debbie? Um, restrictions. At the moment, the current pension scheme regulations allow you to pay 50% of your pay into an AVC. Our AVC group provider is Prudential, so if you were doing it through our provider, that would be Prudential. At the moment, someone retiring can then take that AVC um, up to the inland revenue limit, so they can take some of it as tax-free cash within those limits and then they have to take anything else as a, as a pension. At the moment, as the regulations are drafted for next year, that 50% limit is actually restrict, uh, um, has been taken out of the regulations, so um, you may even be able to put more into an AVC next year, but we don't know whether that's an omission or whether it's been done on purpose, so we're just waiting for a clarification as well. Depending okay. on how much I put in. There was a lady, would, would a lady ta impl there. Tax implications on that, depending how much I put in? Um, AVCs up to the 50%, you get tax relief on your contribution. Okay. Any pension that you then get out at the end of the day from it would be taxed under normal rules. There, as I said, a certain amount of it you can take as tax-free cash under revenue limits, along with your lump sum from the, the, the LGPS scheme. Um, anything you ever take as a pension, the same as our pension, is then subject to normal taxation rules at receipt. Okay, thank you. Okay, there was a lady a bit further down. Uh, is there a chance that they could do away with AVCs and ARCs altogether? Because I understand they haven't quite um, confirmed the situation in the new rules. Um, they haven't confirmed the transitional regulations, which are one of the ones that are missing, will actually say what sort of carries on and change and stays from the current scheme going forward. Um, ARCs, which are additional regular contributions for anybody in, in the audience that doesn't know what those are, and that's when you're buying pension in the local government pension scheme as opposed to paying into um, a money purchase pot with a prudential or a, a separate provider. They won't be available to purchase in the same way as they are now because those are what's available under the current rules. In the new scheme, though, there is still going to be a facility to buy additional pension should you wish to or should employers wish to. We don't know the factors yet of how expensive or not it's going to be do, uh, to pay it, but once we get those factors, we'll make sure we publish them for everybody. Okay. And, and so people who've got ARCs under the 
under this scheme they'll remain the same? That's what I can't give you a definitive answer because we haven't got the legislation, but anybody who is paying them, as soon as we know whether you have to stop or whether you can continue paying, we'll contact those people and let them know. Okay, the gen gentleman just there. Um, a question for Debbie. Um, just as I understand, you said that uh, when people retire after 65, the life assurance carries on for 10 years. If you take early retirement, does it carry on for 10 years after the date you retire or after uh, 65 still? So it's up until the normal retirement age and then 10 years beyond that. No, it is from when you retire. If you retire after 65, it's actually restricted then because you're, you've chosen to take it later. So if you retire earlier than 65, so someone who retired at 60 would have a 10-year guarantee. So 10-year is the maximum guarantee someone would get, but it may start knocking, um, reducing after age 65. Okay. Uh, down the front here, we've got, please. I've got several, but very brief questions. First of all, I don't count on Shropshire going broke, but I wouldn't see it as unlikely that some of the privatised services could get into real difficulty, particularly the large company that Shropshire is supporting. If they run into difficulty, does the Shropshire scheme protect the employees who didn't choose to move but we're required to move. That's the first one. Is it James or Debbie, is it? A diff different sort of sides to the, to the question, really, I suppose. the depends on what you mean, protecting the employees. If they were transferred under a contract and that service was still required, you would expect the service to be relet. And if the individuals had had eligibility for the local government pension scheme, that would still be part of the contract being relet to somebody else to give them continued employment and continued membership of the pension scheme. Even if the uh, company concerned ran into difficulties and couldn't afford to keep paying out pension? The, that depends on the contract when it was set up and the admission into the pension scheme. There, some employers operate bonds to cover, if they can't cover their pension scheme liabilities, then they'll usually either have a guarantor, so it could be a scheme employer, could be Shropshire Council, could be um, Telford and Reeking, could be somebody else, or they may have put a bond in place which is like an insurance. And you would see Shropshire thinking about its ex-employees wanting to ensure that that was properly done? Every admission into the pension scheme goes through the pensions committee and our um, policy at the moment is that they're either always guaranteed by a scheme employer, so they have to risk that then to know what risk they're taking on and by taking that contract, or to reduce their risk they can insist on that company takes out a bond. So we only allow admissions that we make sure that the transferring employer is fully aware of its liabilities. I think it answers it, but I don't feel it's 100%. Uh, I'm glad I'm in the group that's already drawing pension. Uh, the individual is guaranteed to get their pension. So the individual is guaranteed. Their pension would not disappear because of us being a statutory scheme. The issues, how would the pension fund get their money, wouldn't have an effect on the individual. Is that a better answer? The employee wouldn't lose out. So all of those employees going into IP&E are secure in their pension ultimately? In their pension provision, yes. Yeah. Second thing is, is it possible to say what Shropshire's pension scheme costs in administrative costs in comparison to privately run pension schemes? I think that's James, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is possible. Um, it depends which, which private schemes you were talking about. I mean, we can, we can certainly get some sort of comparative information together if that would be helpful. But, but you would know what Shropshire's administrative costs we, we are. We know what Shropshire's administrative costs and are. And that would be a percentage figure? A percentage of... Uh, the of, a, of the overall cost of the scheme? Yeah, yeah absolutely. What, roughly 4%? Is it, what's the, the it's, cost of it's, that? It's a million pounds for the administration expenses, but obviously you've got the... Investment managers' expenses on top of that, but to administer the scheme, it's around about a million pounds. 
My understanding is that the Shropshire uh, pension scheme is very low on the rankings of, of comparable uh, other pension schemes in the, in the local authority uh, realm. So. And the last question is, is there an overall body who looks at the competence and uh, um, performance of the fund managers, do, do, of the funds, fund managers, do they have an overseeing body in some way? So that if they were running into difficulties in, we, in the way which we know banks ran into difficulties, would that be identified before there was some sort of problem? Yeah, we, we've uh, got an investment consultant, Aon Hewitt, based in London. So they've got teams of researchers that research all our managers on an ongoing basis. So if there's any, if they're coming into any difficulties or there's any, if there's any trouble with that particular manager, they let us know and we can take action through the pensions committee to um, terminate that contract immediately. Thanks. I'd also say it's a fund manager, <clears throat> and I think it's, uh, it's probably true of all the ones that are listed. Each is uh, controlled by the FCA. Uh, and many are controlled by the SEC in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So they would be they would be registered investment advisors and subject to those controls. Yeah. As well as you, it's though we also have a, 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 an independent pension advisor sits yeah, on the committee who does nothing to do with you. It's who, who puts a different point of view. So we get a, a really rounded point of view of what's the best thing to do. So, so th I think the governance part of that is really well covered. Thank okay. You very much. Any more questions? No? No more questions? Well, I think that leaves me to thank you all for, uh, for coming out. There's been a very good attendance. We had 70 at Telford this morning, so I think Shropshire's done a lot more, uh, a lot more interested people in, in, um, in Shrewsbury. And thank, thank you all, and thank you, thank you to the panel as well. So thank you all for coming. Yeah.